Welcome to, to New America, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Prem Trivedi. I'm the policy director at the Open Technology Institute here. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this important conversation on the FCC's restoration of its title to authority to regulate broadband internet access services. Um, appreciate everyone joining us here today, both in person here and online. Uh, New America is dedicated to renewing the promise of America by continuing to realize our nation's highest ideals, honestly confronting the challenges that are caused by rapid technological and social change, and seizing the opportunities that those changes create. And the Open Technology Institute here at New America is part of our group of technology and democracy programs, tech-centered programs that share a vision of a world in which technological innovation produces tools through which people advance and strengthen democracy and reduce inequality. Um, and, and since 2009, at OTI's inception, our mission has been to research and advocate for policy and technical solutions that drive equitable access to digital technology and its benefits. It's all too easy in important discussions, like for example, those around AI today, to lose sight of the fact that Americans cannot equitably benefit from the digital age and its innovations without high quality, ubiquitous, and affordable broadband. That's exactly why OTI has been focused on connectivity since its inception nearly 15 years ago. Broadband access is too fundamental and too important for Americans to be without an FCC that's empowered to conduct meaningful oversight of ISPs, to study network performance, and to protect consumers. We need the FCC, in short, to be what Chairwoman Rosenworcel has called, quote, a referee on the field, looking out for the public interest. This is why OTI was a staunch supporter of the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order, rules that were issued thanks to the agency's leadership and to a to dogged advocacy from a broad coalition. And it's why we fought the rollback of those rules in 2017. And now here we are again in 2024, um, poised for the FCC under the leadership of, of Chairwoman Rosenworcel to restore its authority under Title II of the Communications Act to regulate broadband internet access service. So this is of course about net neutrality, which remains vital to content creators, um, to small businesses, and, and to artists, and to consumers writ large. But Title II reclassification is also about more than that. Right? It's about allowing the agency to take greater action on a range of issues, including competition and privacy, cybersecurity and network resilience, and public safety. So today's event dives deeper into the benefits of Title II reclassification that go beyond net neutrality. So with all of that at the outset, let me say we are delighted to have with us today Ramesh Nagarajan, Chief Legal Advisor in the office of Chairwoman Rosenworcel, here today to deliver a keynote. Um, after he, he offers some remarks, we'll move to a panel discussion moderated by OTI's own Reza Panjwani, Senior Counsel here for Connectivity, and an excellent group that will unpack the wide-ranging implications of Title II reclassification. Just a few more words about Ramesh. Um, prior to taking up his current role, he was chair of the Chairwoman's Legal Advisor on Wireline and Enforcement Issues, and before that, he served in the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau as Deputy Division Chief for the Competition Policy Division. There are more details, which I won't, which I won't offer right now, but suffice it to say, Ramesh brings a wealth of experience to the table, and we're fortunate to have him with us here today. So please join me in welcoming him. Thanks for inviting me today, and thank you for that, that very kind introduction. Um, you know, it was almost four years ago the COVID pandemic upended daily life. As Chairman Rosenworcel says, we were all told to mask up, stay home, and hunker down. Almost overnight, for so many of us, work, school, healthcare, social life, all moved online. As a society, we did respond. We made a historic commitment to broadband for all. Congress invested billions of dollars in broadband deployment and affordability, culminated, of course, in the $65 billion investment in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Because Congress understood, once and for all, that everyone everywhere needs broadband, needs it to be accessible and affordable. What the pandemic also did, like nothing before, was to make it crystal clear that broadband is essential infrastructure for modern life. 
Sure, we're back for events like this in person, but just think for a second about how much of office work, or civil, civic life, entertainment has shifted online just since 2019. Even as internet access has become more critical to our society, however, our institutions haven't kept up. Today, there is no expert agency ensuring the internet is fast, open, and fair. You know, ever since the modern internet emerged in the 1990s, it was the FCC that had that role. That makes sense. These are principles deep in the Communications Act. Your phone company couldn't stop your call from going through or edit what you were saying. You picked up your phone, you dialed the numbers, and they went to where you wanted them to go. Now today, communications means predominantly access to the internet. But in 2017, the previous administration walked away. It gave up the FCC's authority over the most important infrastructure of our time. The chairwoman opposed that rash decision then, and she has proposed that the FCC restore its authority and bring back net neutrality. I know today's event is about Title II beyond net neutrality, but before we get beyond net neutrality, I think it's important to underscore two points. Now first, net neutrality on a bipartisan basis, first, on the FCC, on a bipartisan basis, for many years across multiple chairs, different parties, has worked to protect open, the open internet and net neutrality. And second, over those multiple decades and many chairs and many parties, it became clear in a series of court decisions that Title II is the sustainable legal foundation for net neutrality. Now let me unpack this a bit. So, as I said, for many years, the FCC has stood for the open internet. It was first Chairman Michael Powell, President George W. Bush's FCC, FCC, first FCC chair, who talked about the four internet freedoms in 2004. These included consumers' freedom to access content, run applications, and connect devices of their own choice. It was under Chairman Martin, President Bush's second FCC chair, the commission unanimously adopted the internet policy statement. This affirmed consumers had the right to access the content, run the applications, and connect devices of their own choosing. These meant that consumers and not broadband providers made their own choices, consumers, not broadband providers, made their own choices about what they wanted to see and where they wanted to go on the internet. The FCC took action on these principles. They were incorporated, incorporated as conditions into several merger orders under both Republican and Democratic administrations. They therefore applied to major companies like AT&T and Comcast and Verizon. Let's turn to 2008. Broadband was classified under Title I, but the FCC was serious about protecting the open internet. There was a complaint filed at the FCC that Comcast was blocking and slowing down BitTorrent. It was Chairman Martin's FCC that attempted to enforce the principles in the internet policy statement that consumers should be able to access the content and applications of their own choosing. It went to court, and the DC Circuit said no. It said the, DC, the FCC's decision was not supported by the Commission's ancillary authority, and it noted that broadband was classified as a Title I service. Okay, let's turn to 2010. Chairman Janikowski, President Obama's first FCC chair, sought to use Section 706 in the Telecommunications Act as authority for net neutrality rules, but keeping broadband under Title I. Again, the DC Circuit said no. This time, the court agreed Section 706 was a valid use of regulatory authority, but the rules that said no discrimination, no blocking, these were invalid because they treated broadband, broadband providers as common carriers. And we know common carriers are classified under Title II. So the commission went back at it. In 2015, it classified broadband as a Title II service. And this time, the classification decision and the net neutrality rules which included rules against blocking, throttling, fast lanes, and a general conduct standard, they were upheld in full by the DC Circuit. However, in 2017, the last administration reopened the issue and it repealed debt neutrality, despite a fierce public backlash. That brings us to today. It was last October where the FCC voted to begin the process to reverse this, this decision and bring back the protections that ensure the internet is fast, open, and fair. So I hope that potted history makes two things clear. First, there is a long bipartisan history of the FCC fighting for these rules, fighting for net neutrality. And second, 
It's the classification of broadband under Title II that is the foundation of strong, legally sustainable net neutrality rules. And those are rules that mean that you can go where you want and do what you want to do online without your provider making those choices for you. It's your choice. But like this event promises, and as the chairman has emphasized, Title II does go beyond net neutrality. It's the part of the law that gives the FCC authority to look out for the public interest. I know that the excellent panelists will get into the details of what this means, but let me mention three areas very briefly. First, national security. The FCC has an important role to play here. It's right in Section 1 of the Communications Act. It says, and this is Section 1 of the Communications Act of 1934, the FCC was created for, among other purposes, the national defense. And the Commission has been active on a bipartisan basis in fulfilling this role. Based on a number of recommendations from law enforcement and security agencies, the FCC has revoked the Section 214 authority for four Chinese government-controlled companies to provide telecommunication services in the United States. Now, Section 214, as you may know, is under Title II of the law. So those actions apply to services classified under Title II. Right now, broadband is not classified under Title II. So the Commission's decision, while important, does not extend to broadband networks. That is a loophole that Sherman thinks needs to be closed. When it comes to cybersecurity, certainly a national security issue, the FCC is part of a whole government approach focusing on identifying and addressing vulnerabilities to critical infrastructure like broadband networks. But again, Title II does not extend to broadband. So we have limited authority to incorporate updated standards into our network policies. Let's talk about public safety. Title II would provide the legal foundation for the FCC to collect outage reports when broadband networks go down. Our current reporting system focuses on long distance voice outages. That's something that just doesn't make sense in today's world. Today's world, it's broadband connectivity that's essential. And third, let me mention privacy. Section 222 of the Communications Act requires that carriers protect their consumers' proprietary information. And this includes very sensitive information like location data. My carrier knows certainly that I'm here today because I put that in Google before I walked down here. But these privacy protections right now only apply to voice service and not broadband. That doesn't make sense in our always connected world with our smartphones constantly within our arm's reach. In my case, it's actually two smartphones. You know, there's certainly more to Title II. There's access to critical inputs like utility poles. There's updating our rules for serving apartment buildings. There's the Universal Service Fund's ability to support broadband. I know the panel will get into shortly. And a word on what Title II is not about. This is Title II with forbearance. So as the chairman has said, the FCC won't regulate rates. But for now, let me close by reminding you where we were 47 months ago. I personally was scrambling to get my kids signed into online school while juggling the sudden shift of full-time telework. March 2020 will be permanently etched into the memories of all of us who lived through that time. I would submit it should also remind us just how essential internet access is and why we need it to be fast, open, and fair. And in the end, that is why we need Title II. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Appreciate those remarks. And we'll now bring our panel up onto the stage, moderated by OTI's Reza Panjwani. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Find the right set of notes here. So thank you for that great table setting, Ramesh. I think that really helps to place this proceeding and this bit of the law into a good bit of context. Um, Title II is been a bit of a policy cipher over the last 20 years where, as we've discussed the correct framing and the correct approach to regulating broadband internet access, we've kind of come up to a view, depending on your perspective, it's either this anachronistic, you know, 100-year-old telephone law, or on the other end of the spectrum, it's just the obvious conclusion to reading the definition of telecommunication service in the act and going, aha, that's what internet access is, which a certain late Supreme Court justice might agree with that approach. Now, 
I'm going to introduce our lovely panelists here who are going to talk a bit about how Title II is still relevant to approaches to broadband access, how that filters down to their organizations, their memberships, and then we'll get a little bit into some of the policy aspects, including net neutrality, but going beyond a bit to sort of shed some light on why this is so relevant today and going forward. So working down the row here, Angie Cronenberg is the president of Encompass. She is responsible for managing the Encompass. As president, she is responsible for managing the Encompass policy team and its work for federal, state, and local governments. And she leads the association's efforts on membership and business development. She joined the association in 2013 as its chief advocate and general counsel and became president in 2023. Angie has successfully influenced and shaped some of the most complex high-profile matters in the communications space. And she's an expert on technology and telecom policy, including broadband deployment, access, availability, universal service, net neutrality, merger review, competition policy, administrative law, making her perfect for this particular deep dive. She's also been an integral to the association's modernization and growth. Prior to Encompass, Angie was legal advisor to FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn, where she was primarily responsible for the commissioner's wireline and broadband agenda, including the commissioner's work as chair of three federal state joint boards. Uh, prior to her work at the commission, Angie practiced telecom and media law in Washington, DC. Next, we have Stacy Gray. Stacy is the Senior Director for U.S. Policy at the Future of Privacy Forum and supports FPF's U.S. engagement for consumer privacy research analysis and policymaker education. At FPF, she has spent many years focusing on the privacy implications of data collection in online and mobile advertising, platform regulation, cross-device tracking, smart homes, and the Internet of Things, including publishing extensive work and providing congressional testimony on the intersection of emerging technologies, and federal privacy regulation and enforcement. Next, we have Kevin Erickson, director of the Future of Music Coalition. Kevin directs the Coalition, a nonprofit think tank at the intersection of music, technology, and policy to ensure that musicians' independent voices are heard on the issues that impact them, working for policies and systems that align the interests of music creators and fans, and that allow diverse local music communities to thrive. Kevin's background includes direct experience in many aspects of the industry, including concert booking and promotion, community radio, and independent music retail. And he continues to work as a record producer and musician. Finally, we have Human Hadiati, Senior Strategic Research Associate for Telecommun Telecommunications Policy at Communications Workers of America. He is responsible for advising the union's telecommunications policy program. Since 2018, he has supported the union's Speed Matters campaign, promoting public policies, that encourage investment in affordable, high-speed broadband networks for all. He's also supported CWA's Build Broadband Better campaign to educate the public and legislators on the importance of building broadband infrastructure by highly trained union workers and not low-wage contractors that risk safety and quality. As a representative of CWA, he served on the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group of the FCC's Equity and Diversity Council. So, welcome. So, I'd like to get things started by talking, you know, at a very high level, we have this proceeding to reclassify <coughs> broadband internet access service as a Title II service under the FCC's framework for regulation. Now, you know, one of the things you might hear in the chatter about this topic is, that's so 2015, or 2008, or 1996 as an approach. We don't need to worry about this. Uh, Everything's great. We have apps. We have content streaming. The world is wonderful. We don't need to worry about this. This is just a distraction. I, and I think most of us would posit by our position in this proceeding, think that's not true. So I want to give each of you an opportunity to talk a bit about why Title II is still relevant and how your organizations are thinking about it and some of the topics you want to move forward on once we get this foundational step out of the way. So, Angie. Thank you so much for including me on today's panel. It's really wonderful to be here. And I want to acknowledge that today is a really important day. It's the 28th birthday of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which ensured that competition was going to be introduced into the local telecommunications marketplace. It was a bipartisan 
piece of legislation that was signed by Democratic President Bill Clinton, and today is its 28th birthday, so happy birthday, 96 Telecom Act. <laughs> Why is that important for this conversation? It's because net neutrality policy is competition policy. It ensures that consumers, small businesses can access the online content, applications, services of their choice without undue interference by their ISP. And I really look forward to diving deeper into why this is so an important foundational aspect of net neutrality and how ultimately the Title II classification is going to allow for more broadband companies to enter the market and access consumers and give them more choice. So not only will consumers have choice about online content, they also are going to get more choice for their broadband provider, which is critical right now since there's so little choice, especially in the home market. Thank you. Stacy. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Reza. Uh, so first, I should say Future Privacy Forum, for those who aren't familiar with this, um, we are a Washington, D.C.-based think tank focused on data protection and privacy law and policy around the world. We have a large global presence as well. Um, and and many of our many of our members and supporters are from across a very wide spectrum of business interests, including both buys providers and edge providers. So, organizationally, FPF doesn't have a position or an advocacy role in Title II reclassification. However, Title II reclassification is incredibly relevant to individual privacy. Um, for, for lots of reasons. The, the most obvious one is that it's the most clear hook, um, arguably mandate, that the FCC has for promulgating um, specific and robust privacy rules for bias providers um, under Section 20, uh, 222 and the, the CPNI rules that already exist. Um, Reclassifying bias providers under Title II also automatically exempts them from the current jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, which is generally thought to be kind of the privacy cop on the beat uh, in, in the business world, the, the lead privacy regulator for the last 20 years or so in the rest of um, the industry. Um, so, so this is super relevant. It really gets to the question of who the regulator is going to be and what kind of authority and what the scope of that authority is going to be around uh, privacy. And on that question, um, there are kind of pros and cons to both. And one of the things I really want to highlight today is just how dramatically the landscape, both the legal and the technology landscape, has changed since 2015. Um, just the introduction and the implementation of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU, has been a massive sea change for um, the online advertising industry in particular, as well as the rest of the business world. Um, you know, add to that 10 plus new state comprehensive privacy laws in the United States, more and more aggressive enforcement from the Federal Trade Commission, particularly in the last year. Uh, we're looking ahead to potential rulemaking from the FTC. So it's, it's a pretty rapidly changing world. So a lot of the arguments that we were thinking about in 2016 with respect to you know, which option would be a better or a stronger uh, privacy um, regulator and enforcer uh, have, have shifted. So people who might have had a strong opinion, for instance, against the role of the FTC in 2016 might want to look at that anew in light of what they've been doing over the last year. Um, anyway, I, <laughs> I can stop there. It, it is a super, super relevant question. Um, only other thing I will note is that it's very, very clear that the FCC has been an active privacy enforcer in its existing role uh, over some of these same entities in their role as telecommunications providers, so wireless providers, um, bringing actions and really relevant settlements uh, in, in the uh, around issues like uh, super cookies, and more recently than that, the sharing and aggregation of precise geolocation data from wireless providers. So they've been a really strong enforcer in their current role. What we're really talking about with Title II reclassification is web browsing. So super, super interested to dive in more. Thank you. Kevin, so I think you're also our, our so you can have one non-lawyer. So <laughs> we have to, you know, make sure we've got a diverse 
you know, range of experiences here, but tell us a little bit about, you know, what Title II means for the creator community, and especially with your experience on the music community. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's been so much transformation that's been happening in the, the, um, the music business uh, since we began participating in these conversations around these issues. I, like, so I was digging through our archives and I brought the, the compilation CD that we put out in support of net neutrality in what was it, like 2009, um, right? And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's great, it holds up. Um, but like, you know, like, right? So uh, obviously like now compact discs and the sale of compact discs uh, has, has become outmoded and more and more music listening is happening online. There's been these transformational shifts across the board. Um, but the basic principles but that we approach this issue with from the beginning really haven't changed. And that's the uh, musicians and creators generally to be able to sustain uh, careers, both in terms of the economic piece of it and in terms of the creative expression piece of it. They need a couple of basic things. They need access to audiences and they need sustainable levels of compensation. And to get sustainable le levels of comp comp compensation, you need to have an ecosystem that's characterized by diversity of practice, by maximization of choice. That means that uh, you get to choose to work with the platforms based on what works best for your individual business model. Um, and uh, getting that neutrality right in Title II ultimately, I, th I think, continues to be um, fundamental for both of those pieces of the puzzle, uh, for the ability to have the same level of access to, to audiences that uh, huge corporations have, um, to be able to choose a platform that works for you because it works for you, not because they're the platform that has the ability to make the best deal with ISPs, right? Those, those basic principles continue to, to inform how we, th how we think of these things. And then in a post-pandemic environment, there's, there's these new, um, you know, the, in the internet was already the, the center of where the, the commerce happens, the center of where, where creative expression was happening. Um, over the course of the pandemic, it became even more central. Um, and, uh, you know, in this post-pandemic environment, a lot of that is going to continue to be the case. We've seen, uh, you know, we work with a lot of arts and culture organizations across disciplines uh, with uh, symphonies and orchestras and dance companies and theater companies, you know, all of us lining up behind net neutrality uh, because in part, um, they are reliant on the internet to reach audiences in the same way that individual artists are, um, as well as to do, fundraising. And so there, over the course of the pandemic, we saw all of these new innovative initiatives. And some of this is really exciting because it's an allowing um, these uh, institutions that are providing the, all of these diverse, Im important cultural, um, that are elevating all these cult diverse voices to be able to connect to audiences in new ways. And as we, you know, if we contextualize it in the broader um, framework of uh, equitable access to broadband, we're opening up possibilities for these, uh, for new forms of access to culture for audiences that historically would have been excluded. Um, like, not to try and put a silver lining on the pandemic, but it has opened up a lot of experimentation um, among the broader arts and culture groups to like think like, how can we bring um, bring audiences into these spaces that wouldn't have been able to access them before. Um, but the ability to continue to do that, and the ability to do that effectively, and the ability to, um, you know, compete, or even just to, to, the ability to speak and the ability to be heard is, is continues to be dependent on just having like the, the basic foundational rules of the road that apply to everyone in the space. Thank you. And 
Human, so your organization is quite literally hands-on with the internet. Um, so what are some of the issues and topics that make Title II relevant for your members and your, your organization? Yep, yep. And first of all, apologies for losing my voice this morning. Um, so yeah, I'll try to be brief, but I'd like to talk about some of this uh, in, in, uh, later on. But so CWA as labor union that represents majority of telecom workers uh, in the U.S. Uh, our BCBC and hear from our members on a daily basis about things that are happening in the field, uh, problems with telecom deployments and issues that are going on, outages and so on. So CWA believes that Title II is very important because uh, it's essential for public safety, for network resiliency. With Title II, regulators have authority to uh, require service quality standards and basic safeguards so that networks are there at times of emergency. We think it's important for uh, protecting customers during uh, disconnections with Title II. Uh, authorities can require uh, from the companies to notify customers and uh, help protect basic, provide basic protections. Title II is important for future of lifeline, ACP programs. It's uh, essential for making sure that the USF reform is done properly and that there's a sustainable funding available in the long term. And uh, it's also essential for the federal and state partnership in overseeing broadband infrastructure with uh, Title II. State authorities can uh, help as partners with the FCC uh, on a lot of issues, including pole attachments and uh, things, other things that are important for deployments. Great, so I, just to highlight some of what we've heard, right, is you know, competition, we've heard about um, privacy, about public safety, about you know, traditional innovation, access and non-discrimination, affordability, reliability. These are all sort of different topics that Title II opens the door to. So, I'd like to sort of unpack some of that a bit and kind of work through each of them. And I want to mention, though, that on a lot of these issues, our organizations, I think, are not necessarily in agreement on what the exact correct approach should be on affordability or on poll attachments. But I think we're in agreement that we need to lay the foundation and then we can get to each of those issues in turn rather than just constantly talking about them prospectively in the future and we can actually move forward with the policy agenda one way or the other. So let's kind of talk a bit about competition. You talked about, Angie, both competition in terms of like providers for consumers. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, so today's marketplace for home broadband service is highly concentrated and consumers don't have a lot of choice. So most consumers only have one or at most two choices. And the higher the speed the broadband, the fewer choices they have. So oftentimes the most highest speed broadband availability to them is a monopoly. What do we do to fix that problem? Well, we need to be promoting and enabling more deployment, more broadband deployment. In today's marketplace, more providers today are offering just broadband service. They're not also offering a telecommunication service or a cable video service. And this is because consumers now want to be able to access all the different options they can online. As a result of that, these broadband-only providers don't get the same kinds of protections that are afforded by Title II of the Communications Act, which is what Congress amended in the 96 Act to ensure that we could promote more network competition. So the way Encompass sees it, and we're representing the competitive providers that are entering the market, that are doing these builds, forcing them to offer a voice telecommunication service in order to access the Title II provisions that give them access to the polls, access to the buildings, access to the customers, to be able to bring a petition to the FCC to say, here are the local problems that we have and we need you to preempt them. They can't do any of that right now unless they also offer a voice product. And we think that that's really not great. That's not where the market is going. The market is going towards a broadband only offerings. Congress has given significant amounts of funding. We heard this from Ramesh, right? To ensure that every American can access a broadband network. Those providers are likely to be broadband only providers. They are gonna need the Title II provisions to help them to build the networks faster 
and more affordably. So we think the Title II provisions are absolutely critical for broadband-only providers, and we've made that case in our comments at the FCC. Also, as I noted, we want to ensure that consumers not only get choice of network companies, right, but that they also, once they have their network, they can access everything that's online. What we see with the Encompass members as broadband-only providers, they really are marketing themselves very differently than how the incumbent telecommunications providers and the incumbent cable operators market themselves in the broadband marketplace. They market themselves as net neutrality friendly, as privacy friendly. Like we are an alternative in the marketplace for you, the consumer. They oftentimes are building fiber to the home. Sometimes they're building fiber and a fixed wireless connection to meet that last mile connection. We want to be sure that they can do that as fast as possible. And if they have the non-discriminatory access rights that Title II gives them, they're going to be able to do that. And we think that that is so important. In fact, we think it's so important. We've been talking about this for years. So not only did we fight the repeal of net neutrality because of this issue, there, is, there are some leftover issues from that repeal that we continue to talk about with the FCC through petition for reconsideration. It is that critical to our member companies. I'm going to take a moment to break the panel fourth wall here. So, you know, Angie mentioned competition, and I think it's worth remembering a little bit about how we got here, which is at the turn of the century, we were transitioning from dial-up internet across the board in terms of access, with a few exceptions, maybe enterprise lines. But the dawn of sort of cable modems, DSL, fiber off in the distance. And there was a question around, you know, companies may have an incentive to interfere with or distort those connections for financial gain. What should we do about that? And the menu of options was, well, we can do structural remedies. We can force providers to say you can only sell the pipe and the ISP, the internet connection, has to be a separate unbundled service, which is how you had your telephone bill and your ISP were two separate services. That was considered to be a little bit, you know, interventionist and kind of out of vogue. So what we could do self-regulation, we'll just hope companies behave themselves. The light middle path was net neutrality was the proposal. What if we had anti-discrimination rules? Rather than have this structural remedy, we'll have some rules of the road that everyone has to follow. And What's interesting is, and tying back to our theme, right, of Title II having all of these implications beyond net neutrality is, I believe in the litigation over and the challenge over the 2017 um, order to repeal the net neutrality rules, you know, the court pointed out several policy areas that were just not addressed in the record, pointing out that if you move away from Title II, what are you going to do about public safety. What are you going to do about affordability? That's all under Title II. What are you going to do about poll attachments? That's under Title II. So even as far back as 2017 and 2019, the platform that Title II provided to address all these issues was, you know, noticeable to everyone. So, and I do think that COVID has changed a lot, right? We now have a recognition that every consumer, every business in the United States needs to be connected, right? And we have traditionally had a competition-focused analysis and framework in the United States since the 96 Act. I mean, we used to have a monopoly, right? But there was a decision that was made that competition actually drives more investment, it drives more innovation, and it better serves customers. So we think it is really important that the current commission be forward looking, right? It is not adequate that consumers and businesses just have one choice. Mm -hmm. They need to have multiple choices because that's what's gonna drive our industry to provide better service to customers. So I was really heartened to hear Ramesh include competition in his conversation about why Title II is mm -hmm. critical. So I wanna stick with the infrastructure mm -hmm. topics for, for a few minutes. So, so Human, if you wanna talk a little bit about how you called out public safety, network resiliency, and some of the deployment issues. So if you could go in a little bit more detail about how Title II implicates those, you know, really on the ground issues. Yeah, so as I said, resilience is, you know, important. Public safety uh, is an important thing to, to know that 
these networks are there at times of emergency. Uh, at CWA, we believe that legacy provide existing legacy providers should maintain their networks and have the qualified workforce to do the job. Um, loss of a communication service is a matter of life and death. And this was something that was evident in 2018 uh, when Verizon was throttling uh, Santa Clara fire department's uh, services down to uh, dial-up speeds. This went on for several weeks. The fire department complained to the provider, Verizon, and during this whole time, Verizon was trying to upsell a more expensive plan to them. Uh, and to Verizon's credit, credit, at the end, they accepted their fault and they agreed to voluntarily make some network changes to their business practices, but, you know, that voluntary commitment should not be the way some of these things happen. We need uh, mandatory frameworks uh, for it. In other examples, <clears throat> most consumers do not have Title II regulated services for their communications needs. Uh, right now, for example, in 2021, 85% of wireless, 85% of 911 calls were made through a wireless uh, cellular uh, service. And then in 2019, during the massive wildfires, over half of California counties experienced outages. And this is not just wireless. Uh, over 500,000 households lost service to wireline and cable uh, connections that they had. So this shows like how important this issue is and with increasing natural disasters. A Title II regulated service has to comply with a lot of requirements in order to maintain their service, but with broadband, that goes, you know, that's just out. And that's something that we see with disconnections that are happening. That's a, something that we see uh, everywhere. So in California, what the commission did after all these things that happened, they started a docket to look into resiliency measures for wireless, VoIP, and, uh, and a broadband. And among others, they required, for example, 72 hours of backup power that in areas that are susceptible to wildfires. The, and right now, California is also looking into establishing service quality rules on broadband and internet. But the point I want to make here is that when the commission was like going through this whole thing, the arguments weren't by providers that we don't need 72 hours, we need 24 hours of backup power. And it wasn't over the details of what's needed. Uh, the main argument that was being made is that uh, broadband is an information service, so uh, CPUC, you don't have any authority to uh, do anything in this area because the FCC has decided that it's information service. So I think with reclassification, we can clear the issue and just establish for once that, uh, yes, uh, regulators can look into issues of public safety and resiliency um, at this federal and state level. And so CPUC is the California Public Utilities Commission. And so it's an example of a state stepping in, but you know, wildfires don't only occur in California, right? And there are, I'm guessing, you know, other risks to the network and emergency periods in other states. And so having Title II, it sounds like it would be nice to have those protections for all Americans' networks and emergency needs. So speaking about, you know, all Americans and their needs, Stacey, tell us a bit about sort of the, the privacy framework. You know, you've yeah. mentioned there's this discussion around we've advanced in terms of globally, honestly, how we think about consumer privacy. But, yeah. you know, we talk about privacy often in terms of particular providers or services. But the one thing all of those services have in common is how you connect to them. So you mentioned, you know, location services is yeah. the types of um, very intimate information that the owners of the data connections that we use sort of have access to. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you know, the opportunity, I guess, to, to address some of the specific privacy questions about internet access that Title II would enable potentially? It, 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 absolutely. So, so as I mentioned, so Section 222 gives, I think, the most clear and obvious uh, legal authority to promulgate privacy rules uh, uh, following a reclassification. Um, 
there's some argument, you know, public knowledge has argued that the FCC has other tools available at its disposal under, under for example, Title III, but, um, it, you know, but I'm not an expert enough to really <laughs> speak to that. Um, clearly, Section 222 is the most obvious and the most clear legal hook for this. It's, it's interesting that you raise the point about competition and some of the history of this classification scheme because um, unlike the Federal Trade Commission, the, the FCC has a, not just a role in competition but an affirmative mandate to promote competition. And so there's a reason that uh, CP&I refers to proprietary network information rather than just, for example, personal information, which is the term we use in the rest of the, the, the data protection world, is because it emerged from a concern about um, dial-up providers having a competitive advantage through their privileged access to information over, over the top providers um, and other entities. So we know that access to data is a competitive advantage in, in any sector, right? Um, then there's the question of, are bias providers when it comes to privacy as, a, as kind of a pure matter, just the privacy of what you do online, what websites you visit, what services you're using, are bias providers uniquely situated in comparison to the rest of the world of edge providers in the access to, um, to, to information about what individuals are doing online. Um, there are lots of good reasons to think that they are, and advocates have done a great job over the years articulating this. The FCC has agreed with many of them with respect to the fact that bias providers have access to the identity of the subscriber, access to a level of comprehensiveness of web browsing activity that many edge providers do not have. Um, and I, I think very relevantly, sort of a, a unique relationship with a customer in terms of that subscriber, that customer's choices to avoid um, sharing that data. So the data collection itself is, is almost impossible to avoid. You might have other controls at the level of use or sharing, but the collection itself is, it cannot be avoided. Um, so, all of these are things that the Federal Trade Commission is very used to balancing. Um, one of the things, so, so maybe in contrast to some of these other uh, areas that we're talking about on this panel today, privacy is not something where if you didn't have Title II classification, you wouldn't have any enforcement, right? The Federal Trade Commission has been a, an aggressive privacy enforcer, an aggressive cop on the beat, particularly in the last year. And I'll specifically highlight, hopefully this isn't getting too much in the weeds, but the FTC has this very flexible and capacious uh, uh, regulatory authority and enforcement authority to regulate, uh, to, to enforce against unfair and deceptive trade practices. Now, for 30 years of their privacy enforcement, they've mostly focused on deception. That's led to long privacy policies, a real focus on notice and choice, um, a, a real focus on transparency in a way that I think people are, are increasingly realizing is in, insufficient for a lot of, um, a lot of entities. Um, but that's what they've been doing. Until last year, when you really began to see the FTC leaning into its unfairness authority to uh, bring enforcement actions against entities that perhaps regardless of what they're saying to the consumer are simply engaging in privacy invasive practices that are deemed unfair. Unfairness involves a, a, a careful balancing test around the injury to consumers, the privacy injury to consumers, and the ability to avoid that injury. So all of these, um, you know, arguments about bias providers being uniquely situated in the marketplace, even if you take them at face value, take them as correct, the unfairness authority that the FTC has gives the ability to uh, account for those in a really fact-specific way. So they could absolutely look at a bias provider and find that the, the calculation of whether a privacy practice is unfair or not comes out differently than it might for a Google, a Facebook, uh, an ad network on the commercial web, right? Um, so that, that is all something that should give a lot of heart and a lot of hope to people who have maybe been skeptical of the FTC as an enforcer. 
uh, just looking at it in the last year. They're also undergoing rulemaking this year, which is um, very, very good. I, I don't want to say it's perfect. The FTC still clearly lacks the resources, the funding, the, the capacity that it needs to really be a robust enforcer in this space. Um, they also could use more specific statutory authority, I think, if we're considering um, just general authority of federal agencies over the next five, 10 years to engage in rulemaking. Um, but they have a, a, a very a, a capacious, a flexible, and, and adroit um, statutory authority as is. Um, if the FCC undergoes a similar process, the only thing I'll say is uh, under Title II, if they undergo privacy rulemaking again, and they don't have to, but if they do, they have to be committed to updating it. Um, the landscape changes very, very quickly. Um, in 2016, when the rulemaking found that web browsing data ought to be treated as sensitive and subject to an opt-in consent regime, that was a higher standard than most of the rest of the industry. Um, and that led to you know, complaints from bias providers that they're being treated differently and so on. Um, but when you look back on it now from 2024, you would, I think, be very valid in looking at those 20, 2016 privacy rules and saying, you know, I see a focus on notice and choice, a, a sole focus on notice and choice. I see an opt-in and an opt-out regime. Um, the rest of the world has caught up. Um, not only are we sort of slowly getting to an opt-in consent regime for the rest of the advertising industry as a result of the GDPR and other global frameworks, but in a lot of ways, we are beginning to exceed that through things like the FTC's unfairness authority and state laws and global laws that, that go beyond just opt-in and get to things like data minimization, use purpose limitation, um, and other, other harms associated with the use of data. So conduct rulemaking, you have to keep it up to date. And then they'll be doing this kind of at the same time as the FTC is doing it for the rest of the world. One thing I think we can say really clearly, FPF's position really clearly is we absolutely need a federal comprehensive privacy law in the United States. That's, that's a given. Um, one that would apply to any entity collecting personal information. And um, you know, the hope, I think, is that such a comprehensive privacy law would supersede some of the existing sectoral frameworks, uh, like, uh, you know, there are, there are other sectoral rules that are frankly not as strong as what we could do today, like the privacy rules under GLBA or uh, the VPPA or can spam or kind of pick your sectoral set of regulations. A comprehensive privacy law could supersede some of those. It probably won't supersede all of them. It's unlikely we're going to be replacing HIPAA anytime soon, right? Uh, so I, anyway, um, it's, we're always going to have a little bit of sectoral regulations, not necessarily a bad thing, but we, we absolutely need a comprehensive privacy law. So if, if I could pick a thread from what, you, what you're saying, it sounds like, you know, since our last attempt at broadband privacy rules, sort of like the, the global climate for privacy has advanced. There's an appetite for even stronger rules. Yep. And the, you know, there's this back and forth often over FCC versus FTC. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it sounds like though, arguably there's a, an option for a yes and approach mm -hmm. of great. We have an FTC focused on broader harms and we have an FCC with particular expertise that can use 222 to address a specific, specific subset of, you know, uh, items that the FTC may not be able to reach or as efficiently reach, mm -hmm. um, and now has the opportunity to go further than it did in 2015. Uh, absolutely. Speculating. Yeah, I think there is absolutely potential for either agency to go further than we did in 2015. It just the world was was very different, mm -hmm. um, and it should be a, a work in progress. If you look at, for instance. COPPA, which are our leading quite strong uh, federal privacy law protecting the information, information from children under 13, it's been updated a couple times. It's currently being updated now. And also a law that was passed in the 90s mm -hmm. was then updated in 2013 era to keep up with the fact that mobile devices had become prevalent. So we needed to update these rules to account for things like geolocation data from mobile devices. Um, 
that, that's a good thing. You need ongoing rulemaking authority to keep up with advances in, in both technology and law. Great. Kevin, when you were talking a bit about, um, you know, innovation and choice in platforms for the creator community, it's a very sort of traditional framing of how we've thought about net neutrality in the past. And it, it brought to mind, you know, the, you know, Chairman Wheeler's discussion around like the virtuous cycle, the virtuous circle back in 2015, that you know, openness begets innovation, you know, begets growth, and you have this sort of like flywheel of new. And, you know, there's, there, there's the saying that, um, you know, today's uh, you know, innovators will become tomorrow's incumbents. One might say yesterday's innovators and disruptors are today's incumbents. But, you know, what we'd want, it sounds like, is an ongoing opportunity for that cycle to continue that you don't just have one big streaming platform, one big video platform, that you have the opportunity to provide, you know, platforms that address the needs of a diverse array of businesses and creators. I, th I mean, so there's, a, there's elements of that that I think are definitely true. Um, and historically, we look, we can look back at, all, you know, earlier times in the, the, um, the history of like recent, um, so we used to talk about YouTube or Spotify as the upstarts that were going to, or, or even Pandora as like these upstarts that were going to help um, bring about a more democratized cultural ecosystem by um, getting folks around the historic legacy industry gatekeepers, which sometimes are associated with older technologies like uh, AM, FM radio. And there, there, there are moments and instances where, where we can see that, yes, that's worked. And we can also see um, on a fundamental level some of the same um, power dynamics replicating themselves on top of this new technology, that there isn't something inherent about the internet that's that's uh, democratizing on its own uh, without having um, a consist applying a consistent critique of centralized corporate power, um, and 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 so I think that you know I think the yes and framing is is appropriate there that like uh, it doesn't. To, to observe that there are competition problems that emerge from a company like Netflix or Spotify or these large firms having having too much power doesn't um, doesn't uh, under undercut the the importance of of having um, the net neutrality, the Title II piece taken care of. It, it actually emphasizes the importance of, take, of, of having a system. And it's, and it's from our perspective, I, I think the, the incumbent versus upstart narrative, there's a, it's a bit capitalist focused and that isn't necessarily how creative communities think about their practice, especially if they're making work that isn't aiming at like mass cultural hegemony, right? Like if you're, if you're making niche oriented work, the, the kinds of systems and structures and platforms that are going to work for you might look very different. Uh, an example that I point to um, is the Metropolitan Opera has their own app. It's awesome, it's uh, affordable, it's got a huge library of very high quality streaming video of operas and it's making this body of work accessible to you know, a, a broad audience. What they need in terms of an economic model is going to be very different from the licensing terms that they would be able to get from mainstream streaming services. Uh, but, uh, they, they, they've made the investment. They've created a business model that works for them. They're able to get phil philanthropic support for that, and and have have successfully built this thing. We lose that if suddenly, um, you know, their their um, service gets degraded because they're not able to make able to make the same kinds of deals that a Netflix can or an Apple TV can. And understanding that like, yes, speeds are getting faster. Some of these bandwidth concerns are, are changing. Well, we don't know like what's coming down the road in terms of 
4K and 8K streaming or VR, like emerging technologies that are going to continue to be more bandwidth intensive um, as, as, um, uh, as we look further, f further into the future. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, um, the lesson there is not just to think about um, the, the, the potential for the small company now that is going to take over the world, but to think about what is the optimal structure that can sustain a diversity of models in perpetuity, like uh, to create a cultural ecosystem that is not one size fits all, that is able to elevate um, these large expensive things like the Met Opera app, but also able to uh, sustain in, a, in an economically viable way um, the work of creators who are making work that doesn't appeal to a lot of people or who are focused on elevating um, a very specific community voice that, that like talking about issues that are that are um, that are relevant to particular geographic or cultural or um, identity based community um, that's and and again like that basic foundational piece of title two is fundamental to that even as we work on the uh, the other s suite of anti-monopoly work before other agencies. Yeah, I think that's a really great way of thinking about it. It's not just purely, you know, upstart income, and, but just a level playing field for no matter how big you are to have access to subscribers and users. And, you know, I was thinking about the early pandemic. And again, this has become such a, you know, lens through which we view this topic like so many others nowadays is that as we were all trying to figure out how are we going to have events like this how are we going to have gatherings and this range of different tools people use to host events online so you know by and large we've kind of fallen on sort of like the zoom the zoom webinar style format for for doing some of the stuff but i remember i attended an event where there was a sort of um, pixel art type you know 8-bit video game sort of screen and you had a character you moved around and depending on your proximity to other characters you could overhear the conversation participate in a small group or move around and there was a center stage where you know the sort of address to the entire room happened um, and it sounds kind of strange but it was actually kind of delightful um, and you know maybe it's not for everyone but for a particular type of audience and a particular type of community um, it's the right tool and you know it would be a shame if that got you know, didn't have non-discriminatory access to the network to provide that service on an even footing, um, to create a space for something like that. So I think, you know, if there's, I'll just check if there's anything particular anyone would like to come back to that they, that's just sort of holding on to. If not, um, we can open it up to questions from the audience, um, both virtual and in person. Um, so if folks are good, we can open it up. Well, I mean, just quickly on, on the issue of like resiliency, we talked about that, but I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, like benefits of Title II, uh, there's a lot of other important things that applies to like broadband providers. Uh, it helps with protecting cust customers from disconnections. Mm -hmm. Right now, with people that have Title II regulated services, if a, a provider wants to go out of business and stop serving these communities. There's a process, they have to issue a notice, they have to uh, have it for public comment, there's op opportunities to file opposition, there's a uh, provider has to show that there's alternative reliable service, but with uh, Title I, none of these things happen. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's very little oversight, and uh, there are examples, just two months ago, this company called Bailey Cable uh, when out of business without any notification in, uh, to customers uh, serving 12 town or so in uh, Mississippi. And in another example, in 2020, uh, CWA and PK filed uh, a memo by AT&T with the uh, commission showing that AT&T was instructing its technicians when they were trying to get out of specific areas that they could disconnect unregulated DSL service broadband, but uh, 
they were specifically instructing their technicians to not touch regulated Title II services. So if somebody had landline, phone, at home, uh, pot service, they, they were lucky, but the other ones were not. So this is something that's very important, especially as we talk about uh, communities that are left behind and do not have access to any alternative yeah. providers or competitors. I think both Human, you and, and Angie have both provided examples of sort of like the sort of magic that comes when you can call yourself a telephone service, both from a business perspective, what it gives you access to and what protections you get as a consumer. But it's really not about it being telephone versus something else. It's about the framework that we use to think about that particular service. Um, and, you know, the last story I think to end on and that sort of really drove home for me the difference here is again not to come back to the pandemic again but at the outset of this incredible you know epoch shifting moment you had the government step in and say we're going to do something about rent and tenant evictions we're going to do something about mortgage payments student loans all these things we're going to step in and do something to make sure we're protecting folks as we're dealing with this mass disruption and we know that broadband is essential and the FCC couldn't step in and say, no disconnections, no disruptions. You know, credit to the companies who stepped in and said, yes, we agree with this pledge to take care of folks. But it was a promise. It was voluntary. There was no enforcer who could step in and say, we are stepping in on behalf of the American public and consumers and making sure they're protected in this moment. And I think that kind of, for me at least, you know, really revealed the the gulf that just this Title I, Title II difference really represents. So I think we'll throw it open for questions uh, for the panel. I think we have microphones. Yes, if you raise our hand, we'll have a microphone brought to you. Hi, Andy Schwartzman from Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, this is for Angie Cronenberg. Um, I have found historically uh, one of the easiest ways to put an entire audience to sleep is to utter the phrase poll attachments. <laughs> uh, but it is, I think, really important and, and underappreciated importance here. I'm wondering if you could speak to, to poll attachments and, and, and how the impact of Title II is and also its relationship to BEAD. Yeah, so a lot of people do just frame that portion of the Communications Act as just about poll attachments, but it's actually much broader than that which may all still put you to sleep because it's about access to the conduit. You're like, what's a conduit? Well, that's how we string fiber along um, in the rights, public rights of way. This is really important to really all network companies, but in particular, those who are entering the market, they oftentimes are relying upon fiber connectivity and to run fiber along the street, um, you can either dig down into the con, you know, get access to the conduit under the street, or you can access the poles. I don't know if any of you've noticed, but when you drive along roads, oftentimes there are poles, and those have telecommunications facilities, electric, um, and so fiber providers have to get access to that. And right now, fiber providers that only offer a broadband service, that aren't offering a voice service, or that aren't offering a cable video service, don't have rights to get non-discriminatory access. They have to commercially negotiate. So what does that do? It means it raises the cost of access and it makes the process longer. Um, and that is what's so important to Encompass's members is that they have the same rights to the polls and to the conduit as the incumbent providers who've often been on those polls and in the conduit for decades now. And so, you know, if we want consumers and small businesses to have more choice of who their providers are, we need to be ensuring that they have the same non-discriminatory access as the incumbents do. And so that is why Encompass, and we represent the competitive providers in this space, you know, really insist on the commission looking at this issue and dealing with it, both in the old case where it's still pending at the FCC, as well as the current, the current NPRM that's pending at the FCC. We think that in and of itself would be sufficient for a reclassification, but there are many other things that we've talked about on this panel of why it's also important for the FCC to have authority over broadband, the ability to address issues of critical importance to the nation, um, 
having a national framework with an agency that ultimately is responsible for ensuring that every consumer and business not only has access, has affordable access, has competitive choice, we think is, uh, is absolutely important and necessary. Without it, we, we don't have a place to really go right now to say there's an issue here because the broadband service is treated as a Title I unregulated service. Um, and so, you know, we would love for the commission to move forward expeditiously so that they do have the authority to address these issues um, and reinstate the really important no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and the general conduct standard rule that also helps ensure that once consumers have affordable access to a broadband network, they then can access anything online that's lawful um, and have choice in their communication services, their cloud communication services, as well as so many other great content um, companies. You know, you have more choice today for streaming and cloud than ever before, right? But ensuring that that's not going to change um, in the U.S. and having a national framework with an agency who can address, sometimes which can be very sticky issues, like the one that Hunam had discussed about, you know, the service that was being provided by Verizon to the Santa Clara uh, fire department, you know, you need an agency who can who can hear these individual cases and what's going on in the marketplace and address when it's appropriate. Great, thank you. Um, we have from the back. Yes, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I'm an editorial contributor to the Hill newspaper on technology policy. My question, and I. I'm sorry, I arrived a few minutes late, so if this was discussed at the beginning, my apologies, and you just briefly comment on it. But um, I didn't hear much discussion about the Title II coverage for the wireless uh, providers of broadband um, internet um, access services. And Pew Research reports that about 50% of everyone who has wireline access to the internet also has wireless access to the internet and 20 percent of all internet users have no wireline access whatsoever so if title ii is applicable to wireline but not wireless internet service providers um, don't we distort the market and leave consumers sort of um, sitting there um, and I'm sure that many of us have gone for whole days. I know I have when I've never used my wireline internet service. I've just used wireless. On top of this, the satellite, the, the new generation of low Earth orbit satellite providers um, project that they will uh, capture 10% of all internet access service. And in some jurisdictions, rural states, um, that they'll have over 50% of access service. So. Are we are we heading toward is in the current again apologies if we've already discussed this but in the current scheme of things are we heading towards a situation where a wireline internet service provider with ten percent of the market is regulated under Title II and the wireless providers satellite and cellular with ninety percent of the market are not regulated under Title II so thank you. The Commission's current NPRM proposes to regulate all of the technologies that are offering broadband internet access service the same. So they will all have to comply with the net neutrality rules. That would, I think it would, satellite. yep, satellite as well as mobile wireless as well as wireline connectivity. Yeah, I think this is one of the sort of progressions in the history of, of net neutrality where I think in 2010, initially there was an approach to treat the two differently. Um, and since 2015, the approach has been parity to treat them similarly. In fact, you know, the numbers you highlighted, I think, underscore the fact that it's not a secondary service, a complementary service, especially with the expansion of, I think, what folks are calling fixed wireless service, the ability to use 5G to get at home over the wireless uh, you know, communication systems. So. And I think it's important to note that the commission, you know, does look at some of the rules, the general conduct standard being one of them, right, specific to the technology. So let's say, for instance, mobile 
or a fixed wireless technology has certain limitations and the way that they may be managing their traffic is based on the technology limitations. There's an opportunity for the commission um, under its proposal to look specifically at whether or not that's primarily driven by the technical versus business reasons, right? And we think at Encompass, it is really, really important that the commission apply the rules across the board, but that they also take into account the technology differences and that it be primarily driven by technical decisions versus business decisions. Thank you. Um, do we have any online questions? Thanks, I can, I can offer, thanks for the panel discussion, very interesting. So um, let me offer one of the, the questions from online. Uh, you know, can you share any insights from other regions that have implemented alternative regulatory approaches to Title II? And if so, any lessons you'd like to highlight that can be drawn from those? And I'll also offer one other, as folks are, are chewing on that. Um, can you discuss any potential unintended consequences or drawbacks associated with Title II regulatory authority that policymakers should consider? So I thought I'd throw both out for the panel to consider. I'll take a first stab at, um, at that second question. So, you know, I think the unintended consequence that we're thinking about is, you know, leaving any loopholes that would result in something like being treated as well. Maybe a certain application of 5G should be treated separately, um, you know, and create an incentive or unintentionally a loophole to move as much as possible into an unregulated space. And so one of the things that we've been advocating in you know, this proceeding is making sure that broadband is broadband. There's yet to be a case made for any particular you know, technology or service that needs to have special treatment and exemption from uh, the non-discriminatory rules under Title II. So I want to make sure, our, for, speaking for OCI, one of our concerns is making sure that that sort of fair level treatment applies across everything we think of as the internet. And then Encompass, since we also represent competitive small broadband providers, uh, we've spent a significant amount of time in our comments discussing which sections of Title II are really necessary and which ones the commission could forbear on and that we're encouraging them to forbear on or not to forbear on. So there could be implications, right, based upon what ultimately the FCC decides to do. Um, they largely propose to follow 2015 with some potential changes, such as not forbearing on Section 214, which we discussed a little bit about. Um, Section 214 today um, would require, if it were implemented fully, would require that broadband providers seek authority to enter the market. We don't think that's such a great idea. We think we should be encouraging everyone to enter the market, right? We shouldn't force them to go through a process by which the FCC would approve who can enter the market and who cannot. Um, we also think that you know they can study some of these issues on a case-by-case -case basis, such as a market exit. Um, we haven't had the experience where we've had a provider that's exited the market altogether, but then again, you can see potential merger uh, implications where providers may only be broadband providers, right? Who would be looking at those mergers? Would it only be the Department of Justice or would it also be the FCC? So there are a number of things that need to be considered um, and I think closely considered by the FCC as, as they're working on the order and taking into account the changes that have happened over the last you know, number of years since we had um, a review of this issue in the 2015 order. Mm -hmm. And then on international, I've been thinking about this a little bit. And you know, one of the more esoteric aspects of, of you know, the Title II net neutrality debate that's actually fairly fundamental, I would argue, is around what might be called traffic exchange or interconnection, which is how the interplay of the network you know, above your ISP works, where, where they connect to the wider network. What are those agreements? What is the impact of the transit of data between providers? So, the case I would direct folks to is South Korea, where right now there is a debate happening in Europe, to some extent in the US, over you know, should edge providers have to pay to send their data across the network. Um, 
And in South Korea, there's been an implementation of this sort of sender pays model. And it's kind of, I would argue, and other observers have argued, has led to some strange distortions. It's led to some regulatory arbitrage of where data is cached to avoid triggering a payment requirement. It's led to, notably very recently, Twitch uh, withdrawing its service, saying we're no longer going to offer our service in South Korea because this particular regime is costing too much. Right? And so as consumers have to pay more and more for their services, they should be asking, what is driving up the costs of these services that I'm paying for? Is it actually the service I'm paying for? Or somewhere in the system are they being tolled? And I'm paying for that toll in addition. So something for folks to consider as we look to sort of what's happening outside the US. And That's, the FCC and its Imperium does propose to look at those types of issues on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So, and then just like adding some more comments about the question that was asked, like over-regulation, too much regulation is like a concern that's always raised by industry. So, <clears throat> I guess so we're not always going to agree. <laughs> uh, the you know the beauty of like doing a Title II and using states as, as partners with the federal government in like ensuring service quality and things like that is for states that still like regulate telecom. Uh, there's it might not exactly answer the question, but there's like different levels of regulation they have. There are like rules that apply to uh, large ILEX. Uh, there are mid-sized carrier requirements. There are small uh, provider rules that apply. So there's a different levels of requirements that uh, providers have to comply. So the large ILEX may be required to restore service within 48 hours or uh, pay a penalty for phone lines that are regulated, but mid-sized provider might have, you know, more relaxed rules. So these are things that could be, you know, discussed and negotiated and uh, implemented in a way that is fair to uh, encompass members and fair to the big providers too. Great. So if there's any closing thoughts folks would like to offer or let's stab at one of those questions by all means. I know privacy is especially ripe for international. The, uh, on the unintended consequences uh, question, it, it, it's really interesting in particular for uh, CPNI rules and privacy <coughs> under Section 222 because for lots of reasons. I think one, um, I anytime you have um, different regimes like this, you, you have the risk of fragmentation, I guess, in the, in the regulatory landscape, which can lead to legal uncertainty and potentially lower standards. I think. Um, not too many people are, are perhaps terribly worried about bias providers being subject to higher privacy standards, but we certainly don't want them subject to lower privacy standards than the rest of the world. So you, fragmentation it, at any point can lead to some weird gaps and unintended consequences. There's also, if you, perhaps a bit controversial, but there is an economic impact to precluding advertising supported business models. Um, I think one of the things regulators are gonna have to grapple with not just for bias providers, but everyone in the next five years is the extent to which we want to uh, permit kind of pay for privacy schemes uh, across the board, not just for bias providers. But if, if your sole concern is just cost um, and access and affordability, uh, advertising impacts that in a, in a major way. Um, and, uh, and, and finally, we haven't really touched on it today, and it's perhaps not really an unintended consequence, but a consequence is that Section 22 rulemaking, given the trajectory of the Supreme Court, the makeup and the trajectory of the Supreme Court, um, is likely to be undermined uh, as a consequence of decisions around the major questions doctrine, doctrine the Congressional Review Act, um, potentially slash likely, um, doing away with Chevron deference. If you look at some of the previous decisions that have upheld, for instance, um, the open internet order, they rely pretty heavily on deference under the Chevron doctrine to the agency's reasonable interpretation of how uh, vice providers ought to be classified, Title I or Title II. So for rulemaking, there's a bit of a threat of a kind of one-two punch here, which is that the reclassification may be subject to greater scrutiny or less deference, and the classification is a precursor or, or a necessary condition
for privacy rulemaking, which would then it itself be subject to, uh, to greater scrutiny. So perhaps a risk is that you end up with no rules at all for privacy, but you've also precluded the FTC from being an aggressive privacy enforcer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily need rulemaking to do enforcement, but, um, but right, so, so that's a potential regulatory. Yeah, we can definitely do an entire dive on the nuances <laughs> of the FTC exception and their ability to continue regulating carriers in their non-common carriage uh, activities um, and, you know, the future of the regulatory state. And, you know, this is a particularly fascinating area to apply that um, yeah. question because of the fact that it is one of the policy areas that's kind of undergirded, you know, the application of Chevron in the last 23 years. So with that note, though, I think hopefully you've all heard um, something new along with something old as you've thought about Title II. You know, the, the, the cliche is that it's easy to, to miss the forest for the trees. Um, and in this case, I hope by spending a little bit of time on a few trees, it's kind of filled in your concept of the forest a little bit better. One other thing I wanted to note, which I think is important. I think someone said at the beginning, um, maybe consumer perspective on net neutrality isn't as important as it once was. But I do think it's, I, I, I would just kindly disagree with that. Um, mm -hmm. Consumers do still want a national framework of net neutrality policy. Whether you're protected or not shouldn't depend upon which state you live in or that you're doing business in. And um, the most recent net neutrality uh, survey that we have seen is that 72% of consumers, no matter their party affiliation, right, really want a, a national framework of net neutrality policy. Um, and so I, I think it is important for all of us to note that, mm -hmm. that this is still an important part of the conversation of what consumers feel like that they need. Um, and we shouldn't um, get so caught up in what's going to happen post net neutrality that we don't have a recognition that the net neutrality policy itself is really important to ensuring that consumers can obtain the ac access to all the lawful content that's available on the internet without their ISPs interfering um, with the ability to do mm -hmm. that. Um, once they've chosen an ISP, right, that's that's how they access their content, and so. I would just really want all of us to appreciate who are working on this proceeding, that there is still a great desire by consumers to have that national framework and that the FCC should move forward with, and go to order on it. That's a great concluding note. And with that, I think, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you panelists for joining us and providing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.